Well, India still stands strong and we have had a victory today as Pakistan has now announced the release of Indian hero and soldier Wing Commander Abhinandan. India has responded with a very, very powerful press conference addressed by the three arms of our services displaying proof of the Pakistani attack. Take a look. On 27th February 2019, at around 10 hundred hours, Indian Air Force radars detected a large package of Pakistan Air Force aircraft heading towards the Indian territory, towards general area Jangar. They breached the Indian airspace west of Rajori in the Sundarbani area. IF fighters, including MiG-21 Bison, Sukhoi 30 MKI and Mirage 2000 were tasked to intercept the intruding Pakistan Air Force aircraft. The Pakistan Air Force aircraft attempting to target our military installations were in intercepted by the IAF fighter aircraft which foiled their attack. Although PF bombs have fallen in the Indian Army formation compounds, however, they were unable to cause any damage to our military installations. In the aerial combat that ensued, one F-16 of Pakistan Air Force was shot down by an IAF MiG-21 Bison aircraft. The F-16 crashed and fell across the line of control in Pakistan-occupied Jammu and Kashmir. The IAF lost one MiG-21 in the aerial engagement and though the pilot ejected safely, the, his parachute drifted into the Pakistan-occupied JNK, where he was taken into custody by the Pakistan Army. There have been many factually incorrect statements that have been made by Pakistan. The first blatant disinformation was that two IAF aircraft were shot down by Pakistan and three pilots of Indian Air Force were down. This figure was later revised downwards to two IAF aircraft and two pilots. The fact, however, is that Indian Army units had reported sighting two parachutes falling in POK, POJ and K, which were of two F-16 pilots, the aircraft which was shot down by the MiG-21. Secondly, Pakistan claimed that they intentionally dropped weapons in open space where there was no human presence or military posts. The fact is that Pakistan Air Force aircraft targeted military installations. Pakistan also stated that no F-16s were used in the operation and no Pakistani plane was downed by Indian Air Force. There is enough evidence to show that F-16s were used in this mission through the electronic signatures and thereafter the Pakistan, Pakistan is trying to hide this fact. Also, parts of AMRAM air-to-air -air missile, which is carried only on the Pakistan F-16, was recovered east of Rajori within the Indian Territory. IF has also learned that Pakistan has announced that Wing Commander Abhinandan will be returned to India tomorrow. IF is happy and looks forward to return of Wing Commander Abhinandan. Pakistan Army first resorted to unprovoked ceasefire violations, as you are aware, in Sundarbani, Bimbar Gali, Naushera and Krishna Ghati sectors on 26th February uh, with effect from 5 o'clock in the evening and again during the night. This was responded to by the Indian Army in a befitting and appropriate manner. As my Air Force counterpart has elaborated, on 27th February 19, the Pakistan Air Force attempted to target our military establishments in JNK. Uh, specifically, they targeted a brigade headquarter, a battalion headquarter, our defenses, and a logistic installation. However, given the high level of preparedness along the line of control and the immediate and punitive response uh, given by our own forces, the Pakistan Air Force's designs were foiled. I wish to assure the nation that we are fully prepared and in a heightened state of readiness to respond 
to any provocation done good evening ladies and gentlemen the indian navy is deployed in a high state of readiness and remains poised in all three dimensions on surface under sea and in air to deter prevent and defeat any misadventure by pakistan in the maritime domain i can assure you of a resolute swift and strong response by the navy when needed we stand as one with the army and air force to ensure the safety and security of our nation and our citizens jai hind the very important press conference had uh, just concluded about half an hour ago where the three arms of our armed forces addressed the media in a uh, brief in a break of protocol really where it, it was fairly unusual uh, for a press conference like that to be held at all so we've had a very eventful day uh, we've had initially pakistan who came out and said that we will we we do want to talk to india we will re uh, release we will release the uh, pilot as a gesture of peace or a gesture to de escalate india then turned around and said we will not accept any conditions you have to release him as per the geneva convention then we had the pakistan prime minister announcing in his parliament that uh, wing commander abinandan will in fact be released after which the press conference that you just heard joining me on the show prabhudayal former diplomat Colonel V N Thapar is a defence expert and Ram senior journalist. Air Marshal Nirdosh Tiagi and Vinay Tiwari are consulting editor. Gentlemen, thank you so much uh, for joining us on the show. Uh, Vinay, quickly uh, from the point of view of a journalist who's seen a lot of press conferences, this was extremely unusual. Unusual for 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 a tri services joint briefing is not very common. Mm -hmm. uh, as we mentioned earlier, even during Kargil, when the M E A would come for a briefing every single day. they usually used to be accompanied by one of the services officers and not all three together so it is unusual uh, for them to 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 field uh, the second in commands of all the three forces pretty much because they were in that sense of by rank they were almost the second after the generals in the sense so very unusual in that and for them to have presented evidence in this manner to the press again never happened before want to do a press conference in the open outside of south block with yes. the grandeur of rashtrapati bhavan and south block in the background and to display a part of a missile in an open press conference is evidence that is too is very very unusual this has not happened many times before this this has not happened before mr ram uh, we've uh, we've seen all of this play out during the day and we've had a very eventful day like i was saying but again as a very senior journalist uh, what is your response to the press conference we just heard i think the main news for me was that uh, wing commander abhinandan vartaman who son of a highly decorated air force officer yes right at the top Uh, is coming back and uh, on your show fair yesterday i was uh, looking forward exactly to this perhaps a day earlier mm -hmm. so i i would like to uh, appreciate uh, this gesture from pakistan whatever construction is put on it here it's a right thing to do and it's a timely thing to do i think it does help de escalate a dangerous situation as i see it the rest of it is uh, detail for me the central issue here is the return of this brave and in fact heroic uh, indian air force officer son of another one second generation in the air force and uh, we are very very happy to see that yesterday we knew that he was not badly injured he he was he showed great dignity even in that clip in custody uh, but today i think uh, we have this very good news that's the main news for me the rest is detail Absolutely. I, I also want to bring in Air Marshal Nirdosh Tiagi. Um, Air Marshal Tiagi, an unusual press conference there. But if we look at the details, and I think we need to, you know, sort of take it apart because there was a lot going on in that press conference, and look at it piece by piece. Uh, you know, we had Air Vice, Vice Marshal R. G. K. Kapoor, who first spoke on behalf of the Air Force, and he did talk about while well, he talked about the fact that the Pakistan Air Force didn't br did bring in F-16s, and he will prove, and he did uh, evidence for that. he did also say that we are vigilant and we are ready and we remain sort of on guard for anything that pakistan might attempt to do 
So the question also that was asked of him later by one of the journalists was, since we know that Wing Commander Abhinandan is, is going to be released tomorrow, or that promise has been made by Pakistan, but we are not in any way reducing our level of vigilance or our level of readiness uh, for response, does that mean we don't fully trust Pakistan? His answer was, this was, not, this was a gesture in line with the Geneva Convention, which means this is what Pakistan was supposed to do to begin with. What is your response to that? Is, is there a level of mistrust yet between, uh, between India and Pakistan between today and tomorrow? Indian uh, strikes were undertaken with the limited objective of uh, destroying terrorist camp based on hard evidence of intelligence. Now, with this objective having been achieved, India didn't want to escalate. There were two press conferences held, and uh, there was a lot of speculation about uh, what type of uh, operations were carried out, uh, what was the nature of results, what was the verification. Uh, then, uh, subsequent to that, uh, Pakistan attempt to intrude and uh, engagement with Indian aircraft, where they lost uh, one F-16 and we lost one uh, MiG-21. Also, there was a lot of uh, uh, you know, speculative speculation about uh, uh, you know once again about uh, the method of verification, and uh, the main issue, as Mr. Ram mentioned, was about the pilot. You know, that was an event which uh, uh, people were wondering whether India is going to change its stance or uh, uh, how is the release, how long is it going to take. So I'm glad that uh, Pakistan has responded, whether as a matter of, uh, as a gesture of goodwill or under pressure. But uh, the response has to be accepted with grace. And uh, I'm glad that uh, Abhinandan is coming back tomorrow. But uh, the purpose of uh, press conference was to clear some doubts. And those doubts on operational matters cannot be clarified fully. You know, there has to be some operational uh, secrecy maintained. So as much evidence as could be shared, uh, they have tried to put across. And, uh, 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 you know, people like us, uh, retired people and people who participate in debate uh, can speak their mind, but uh, military officers are constrained by, uh, uh, you know, uh, several matters. So to that extent, uh, he didn't take on questions which were beyond the purview of this uh, limited purpose conference. That is true. Uh, and, when I, I, you know, I came back to you with this question about the fact that do you believe that India might still, I mean, there might still be something left um, to chance between today and tomorrow? You know, or is, it, is it locked down? Personally, I don't see that happening, to be very honest. I mean, you have a prime minister of a country who's stood inside his parliament and, yes, and given made a, a solemn statement, promise. Yes. And I think if the, if that can go wrong, then it's hmm. it's an officially a banana republic because then you obviously can't even trust a prime minister speaking in the parliament. I mean, it's pretty much. So I'm not sure, number one. Number two, I very sincerely believe that this wasn't just Imran Khan batting on the front foot or doing something his own. He must have consulted the army and the ISI and everyone else who was important in that country before he announced it in parliament. So pretty much there has there, there must have been discussions before he announced it and everybody is on board with that. Or is, is this an attempt, uh, Prabhu Dayal, to, uh, for, for India through this press conference to say very clearly that yes, we appreciate the release of our pilot, but no, this doesn't mean we're backing down in any way. Well, first of all, let me say that I agree with you that it was an unusual press conference because it involved a foreign country and a representative of the External Affairs Ministry was conspicuous by his absence. Ideally, there should have been a briefing by a representative of the Ministry of Defence and also of the Ministry of External Affairs to put matters in correct perspective. Now, I also echo the sentiments expressed by the other panelists, particularly Mr. Ram, who said that he's relieved that our wing commander is going to be coming back. I would even go to the extent of saying that uh, I am grateful to everybody who's made this possible. The Indian policymakers have surely worked uh, assiduously uh, to, to be in consultation with everybody concerned and bring about his release. Uh, Kamal, earlier in during another program, Kamal Tewari thought that it was only the army and he disagreed with me on a slight count. 
But I think the army working in tandem with the prime minister has also uh, done a, a good thing by uh, working out his release. And if this is any sign of Imran Khan's uh, Naya Pakistan, then I welcome it. But of course, this sort of thing would not have been possible without a lot of diplomatic pressure. The P5 countries have definitely done their best. But, um, Donald Trump had perhaps given an indication when he said that some reasonably attractive news is going to come out of all this. So, uh, at the same time, the US, UK, and France were tabling a resolution for banning Masood Azhar in the UN Security Council. The other two P5 countries, Russia and China, were recently in a meeting with our foreign minister when she visited China. Prince uh, uh, Mohammed bin Salman uh, of Saudi Arabia has a lot of influence in Pakistan, and he had a successful and high-profile visit to India. I'm sure he did his bit. At the same time, our foreign minister is going to be in the UAE for the OIC foreign minister's meeting as a guest of honor. And the UAE, again, exerts a lot of influence on Pakistan. So I'm sure that there was a combination of a lot of external influence on Pakistan, together with good negotiation from our side. I'm sure there was a lot of behind-the-scenes negotiation. So all this, I'm happy, is bringing about the release of our um, wing commander, and uh, I'm glad he's going to be back home. I don't have any misgivings that the Pakistanis will go back on their word, because as Kamal said, they would be uh, appearing to be like a banana republic to change their minds so quickly. Mm -hmm. So um, I echo the sentiments of everybody else uh, that this is uh, uh, hopefully a, an end to, a, uh, to an unhappy chapter. But of course, the fight against terrorism goes on, and that's what's been made clear by our three service chiefs. That battle is not yet over. And for that, we will have to maintain whatever pressure is possible internationally and directly on Pakistan, because ultimately, these terror outfits are located on their territory. And without Pakistan's sincerity, we cannot uh, clam down on them. You know, there is a ban on jaish e mohammed in Pakistan since 2002. But the jaish e mohammed has been changing its name. Yes. It's just a camouflage. It became Tehreek e Furkan, then it became uh, something else, and it became charity organizations. Yes, so yes. So it has acted like a proxy of the Pakistan army, and that has to stop. And we have to continue our struggle in that regard, of course, uh, both directly by striking at uh, terror outfits wherever they are located, but also diplomatically, because diplomatic pressure is very, very significant yes. in these matters. Uh, in, in fact, uh, Vinay, we do have information right now about tomorrow's process. We understand that Wing Commander Abhinandan is currently in Rawalpindi. He is currently in GHQ Rawalpindi, which is the oh. general headquarters uh, uh, of, of the Pakistani army. Uh, tomorrow, there will be a special plane that will take him from GHQ Rawalpindi to Lahore. And from Lahore, he will be driven down to the Baga border and then escorted out into India. Uh, what we don't know, in fact, the last time when we spoke to somebody, uh, we were told that there is the Indians want to be accompanying him while the, the Rawalpindi to Lahore flight is on, and there is no consensus or agreement on that. I think that's perhaps still being discussed, but pretty much they have figured out what is going to be done. Uh, once he comes into Vaga, which is pretty much a standard system, he will, of course, be put through a quick medical test, mm. and then he'll board a special flight to come back to Delhi, and he'll be taken for a debrief, because obviously any officer who returns from captivity has to be put through a debrief, and they usually don't talk to the media at all. Yes, and what happens in a debrief? Well, the debrief, he's asked questions about what happens there and, you know, everything that he can share uh, with the Indian authorities, and that debrief report is never really made public. So, mm. even in the case of flight lift in Nachiketa, when he was brought down in India, uh, he landed at the Delhi airport in the Palam Technical area. He of course, it was done in media presence. We saw him coming down. He yes. stood there for a while, waved, saluted, and then was boarded uh, straight, from a vehicle yeah. and straight away taken for the medical test and a debrief. So there is no real media detailing that happens, neither here nor at Vaga. Yes. Uh, Colonel Thapar is with us as well. Good evening, uh, Colonel Thapar, and thank you for joining us. Uh, the army portion of that press conference was also extremely mm. interesting. Good evening. Uh, the uh, representative of the army uh, basically said one very interesting thing, that our mechanized forces are also on standby. He also said that despite the turn of events, we are committed to peace in the region, but we will not hold back from any response uh, that could be given to someone who has designs of enmity on India or its people. Your response to that statement made by the forces and specifically by the army, Colonel Dapur. All right. 
First of all, I would like to say that shrown of all explanations and arguments, the fact that Abhinandan will be coming back tomorrow has brought a great lot of relief to me uh, and happiness because I have been uh, witness to what happened to uh, the uh, previous record of uh, the Pakistan army as far as the Geneva Conventions are concerned and their violation. Uh, I was, uh, I, I have seen uh, Ajay Ahuja, he was uh, captured and then he was shot. Uh, before that, there is the case of uh, uh, one lady uh, whose husband in 71 was uh, brought down and he was languishing in the jails for such a long time and she pleaded to everyone in Pakistan. She had run from pillar to post and everybody knows that he was there uh, last but uh, she could not find any. Uh, so therefore, there was an apprehension of what could happen. Saurabh Kalya's case is another case in point. But uh, therefore, there was a lot of apprehension till he comes back home safely. But the announcement itself has come as a big relief and a, a reason for happiness. The second point I want to make is the production of this piece of uh, the F-16 armament. That is very, very important, significant, because the F-16s have been given to Pakistan with a clear mandate that they will not be used against India. And that is why Pakistan is denying that they use F-16. Sooner than later, such evidences will be put together and, it will be, and America will be confronted with that, that this is how your aid is being always used against us. So that is the second point. The third point about the mechanized forces and other things that you have said, as yet, there has been the core of this whole operation and the issue has been the terror, terror let loose on our country by the non-state actors. So till now, there is not, no mention of uh, what Imran wants to do about that, what he wants to do with the, their bosses, Hafiz Saeed and others. And uh, therefore, that particular issue has not been addressed at all. And that is the issue on which this whole operation was launched. So we'll have to keep exerting this pressure for some time till this, uh, there's some resolution to this kind of a problem is, uh, is comes to the fore. At the same time, I would like to say that it's not going to be an easy solution because today the Pakistani army may not be, the Pakistani state and army may not be in a position to control this jinn that have let out of the border. Today, there are 50,000 volunteers with the luxury Taiba and a huge number of volunteers with uh, 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 Jasha Muhammad and many other small uh, organizations. 54 of them are there. Now, you see, they are all, uh, they can change their manpower. Luxor people can go into Jesh, Jesh people can go into Luxor. And when a lot of pressure is built, they can simply melt into the Fatah or into Afghanistan and regroup again. So we require an enduring solution for that. And that is why our whatever uh, forces have been deployed at whichever places, they are there to exert certain amount of pressure, continue to ex exert that kind of pressure till we get some uh, solution to this kind of problem, till, till we get some, at least the road map to what they want to do. Thank you. Well, that's very well said, um, and specific, specifically the point about the F-16s being given to Pakistan on the explicit understanding that it will not be used against India, and that is, in fact, uh, you know, the reason why that evidence was so important. But I have a couple of questions about the press conference that I want to open to the entire panel and I want to have you all weigh, uh, weigh in on. So just gesture to me with your hand and let me know if there's something you'd want to come in and say. Uh, my first question is this. The, uh, the evidence, of course, that was, was asked of the forces uh, about the fact that the attack at Badal, uh, that Balakot, that we've achieved that, uh, you know, that mission that we actually have, in fact, destroyed the GEM uh, training camp, to which the answer was that the evidence is with us that the mission was accomplished and it will be up to the government to decide when to release it. Uh, is there a question now for that evidence at all? Because there have been some, some questions raised and evidence has not been released. Uh, Mr. Ram, go ahead. See, I don't take this as the central issue here. 
Yes. Because uh, there has also been an attempt to politicize, uh, not by the armed forces, but by politicians, particularly those in power. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the opposition has protested against what it calls the politicization of the sacrifices of our armed forces. So we don't want that. So let's take that out of the equation. The story is not complete yet. We looked at this with interest, what was produced, but this is not the this is not comprehensive yet. It's not the end of the story. Rival claims will be made. And as an independent journalist, and you also are an independent journalist, Faye, you would like to uh, watch the situation. None of us is, a, I mean, I'm not an expert on this. I leave it to the experts here. But I liked what I heard from uh, uh, the, some of the panelists, uh, particularly that you should accept this with grace. They all seem to recognize this is the main event that happened because they are very happy that this uh, brave officer uh, in that video clip we saw, he conducted himself with great dignity. Uh, yesterday, he was not badly injured. His father has gone on record to say that. So we are proud of uh, this Air Force officer. And also, we must appreciate the fact positive. Don't try to read all kinds of things, why they did it, speculation and so on. It's a let, Let's look at it straight on and say it's a good gesture. It does help to de-escalate a dangerous situation, because both countries have nuclear weapons, whether they're going to use them is a different matter. But the fact is, both countries are declared nuclear weapon states, and everybody recognizes it. We don't want this to escalate. Uh, but we look at this uh, ongoing, uh, you know, it's an ongoing development. Of course, uh, there's a need to eliminate the terror infrastructure on lashkar e taiba whatever I've read. They are more under the influence and control of the Pakistan Armed Forces Army than uh, uh, Jaish, uh, we know. Jaish may have some links, but Jaish is relatively autonomous. This is what the, expert the experts say in all that has been written, all that I've read, subject to, uh, you know, better expertise on this panel. So ja this, this problem remains to be tackled and resolved. And as has just been mentioned by our last panelist who spoke, uh, it's not going to go, it can't, it can't be resolved overnight or very soon. But it's got to be an effort. But the central point of the press conference for me was this news and the Air Force, uh, the armed services welcome this. Uh, just one nuance here. I don't think prisoners of war are always released overnight or in two or three mm -hmm. days. Uh, it, it, could, it could take time. They have to be treated well. But as far as I know, there is no uh, you know, uh, time limit on that as early as possible. It's good. They've done it very fast. Finally, uh, a question to... Uh, La, you know, the last distinguished uh, speaker, if F-16s can't be used against India, uh, that should that should truly mean um, in an offensive way it can't be used. Because if, there, if war breaks out hypothetically, then surely why are the F-16s there? I'd like to know uh, yes. how the Americans are bound well, uh, Pakistan not yes. to use uh, F-16s in any kind of conflict. Okay. Uh, involving, yeah. Yeah. So I'm, yes, uh, in fact, I just want to take that question to Air Marshal Nidosh yeah. Thiagi. If I'm not mistaken, Air Marshal Thiagi, there was an explicit understanding when the U.S. gave or sold the F-16s or agreed to sell the F-16s to Pakistan that it would be used to counter terrorism. India was pretty upset about it. And the answer given to India was that there was an understanding that the F-16s will not be used against India under any circumstances. That understanding has obviously been broken today. Air Marshal Thiagi, if you could help us understand uh, the, the circumstances under which the U.S. sold these F-16s to Pakistan. You see, when F-16 was sold to Pakistan, that time the political situation was quite different. Um, the India didn't matter much to the U.S. And I have heard this uh, end-use uh, restriction argument earlier also. But uh, I'm not convinced that uh, if you have a weapon, you will not use it in war. And uh, who is Pakistan enemy, stated enemy after all? Are they going to use it against Afghanistan or, uh, I mean, uh, who else? So I don't buy that argument, but I want to put in two other issues. You see, this, uh, uh, whether uh, the extent of damage and all uh, is uh, based on the weaponry. I mean, I'm convinced that if coordinates are fed, the weapon will go there. And that depends on the accuracy of intelligence. The weapon is designed to go, uh, if you feed the coordinates, uh, it has multiple uh, method of, uh, say, navigation, and which cannot be jammed, and uh, imagery uh, uh, matching, uh, IAR. 
So it will go there. I mean, that's not the issue. Mm. The issue is uh, there are two things. You know, whenever uh, there were across the border t uh, terrorist activities, there was hesitation to take action because whenever you use air power, it can escalate very fast. So fear of escalation was one. And second is the bogey of uh, nuclear response. You know, uh, that means on the nuclear, one is the conventional ladder and one is the uh, nuclear ladder. So the, these were the issues because when a political decision is taken, you weigh all facts and uh, on, based on your risk evaluation, you uh, take a step. Now, in this case, both these myths have been demolished. You know, you have gone and struck. Uh, whether damage has been done or not, I'm convinced the damage has been done to the extent they wanted, and it's a fair bit of damage. There is some unconfirmed media reports on the which are floating around. I don't want to mention those. Yes. But the important issue is that a message has been conveyed that if you don't keep your terror uh, these people under check, mm. whenever we get intelligence, uh, uh, there will be a strike there. So uh, that is important, and uh, uh, nothing is going to stop that. And uh, the second uh, issue which you had asked me earlier about the mistrust, you see, the uh, one strike cannot, Pakistan cannot change. It's a military state. It cannot change its stance that it has been saying that uh, it is not state-sponsored uh, activity, but uh, something which uh, emanates within India. Now, they're not going to change that. But this change is going to come about slowly. You know, when there is a threat looming large that you can be struck at will, and that is because of the force asymmetry that exists between us. Uh, uh, they, they're going to be careful in future. I just want to state that. Colonel Tapper, go ahead, please. Yeah, actually, uh, what uh, the Air Marshal said, I will follow it up by saying that the damage on ground has happened. I mean, there are no two, two ways about, uh, uh, two opinions on that qu question. And that was the purpose. But the other big purpose was to convey a, a solid message, a direct message to Pakistan mm -hmm. that if you, if we feel the necessity and that we do not get the proper response from you, this kind of a thing can happen again at a larger scale. And that has been properly conveyed. The fact that uh, what the Air Marshal said, as per the literature available, that was a condition for the sale of F-16s uh, that they will not be used against us, but that has been violated, and that must be conveyed to America. Absolutely. In fact, I just want to play out, and I want to bring in, uh, introduce another question, and that's the question of de-escalation, a question we've been asking for the last 24 hours now. Uh, we just play out this piece of the conversation, and this was, uh, you know, Major General Bahal, who responded to one of the questions that was asked by the journalist. Can we play that out, please? As we said, that he has targeted our military installations. As I mentioned, he's targeted military targets. And therefore, the escalation has actually been done by him. So we are prepared, as I told you, we are ready. If he is, provokes us any further, we are prepared for any contingency that is like is, is given to us. The interesting reference of he uh, in, in that press conference. But I think the larger theme, Vinay, in, in the whole conference was that Listen, we are prepared in, in, you know, in air, in water, uh, on land. We're prepared. Um, uh, mechanical infantry is ready. Our submarines are ready. Everybody is ready. So there was a clear, hard conversation or a hard message that was going out that India is not stepping back. We're not de-escalating or we're not in any way taking a softer stance here. We're not. But I think there is one slight but very critical difference. If yes, you remember please. the second statement that was released by the government yesterday, mm -hmm. It called this particular incursion by Pakistan a uh, attack on our military installations. Yes. It was considered and described as a hostile act. Yes. And obviously an attack on the integrity of the nation. Now that was a major ratcheting up of the sentiment vis-a-vis -vis what was happening post Balkot. Yes. That was a preemptive defensive strike. Yes. But today's comment, if you see, his specific terminology, specific word he used was, in case he tries it again, hmm. we are ready. Which means, in many ways, the Indian army or the Indian government believes that what happened yesterday, they are willing to accept that as an exception. Because hmm. if this was to be retaliated, you wouldn't say, we will. if they do it again, I'll do it again. Because, I mean, you know, the conversations that we've had on this channel for the last three days, in fact, were about if Pakistan were to attack or attempt to attack our military installations, that would be an act of war. That would be an act and of war. And it was a question that was asked at this press conference. Do you read this as an act of war? Again, the answer was not very specific, but... 
The answer was we will retaliate. Yeah, so my limited point again. is that there is no retaliation that's going to happen for what happened yesterday uh, yes. in the sectors when they violated Indian airspace. But they are also saying that in case anything like this is attempted, then again. we will retaliate. And yes. we will retaliate with all the three services uh, and the might that we have. Absolutely. Uh, Mr. Ram, do you want to weigh in on this, that the fact that India has sent a clear message that we're, we're grateful or we're happy, actually grateful was not the word, happy was the word, we're happy you're releasing Wing Commander Abhinandan, which is in line with Geneva Convention, which is something you're supposed to do anyway. Do not expect us to soften or to back down as a result of it. Just words. We are happy that he's back and in fairly good health. And we appreciate, the, I appreciate the fact that this is a good gesture, a good step forward. It's not all over. The other thing is, you know, it's not much, not, to escalate is not a macho thing. And to de-escalate is not something that you should be ashamed of. So when you say, Faye, that, oh, we are not de-escalating, I disagree with it. This situation has been has been de-escalating. And, and this release really helps that. Uh, and uh, the nuance that Vinay just uh, mentioned, uh, that's good, that uh, there's a change in terminology. If you're talking about something speculative happening, something prospective happening, and they may say the same thing. So today, the lesson I take from this is, yes, this has been reason handled with in a reasonable way. Problems are left over, but mm -hmm. they'll be resolved mm -hmm. on another day. Today, let us unconditionally welcome the like the uh, guaranteed return of uh, uh, Wing Commander Abhinandan Varthaman. We are very happy for him. We are happy for his father and he is happy for his family. I think that's my, uh, that's the message we should take from this. Very well said. Um, you know, uh, Prabhu Dayal, from the, from the F-16 conversation we were having, the understanding, and I'm sure you understand this uh, really well, uh, the explicit understanding of the use of the X-16s uh, between the U.S. and Pakistan. Can this now be used diplomatically by India to put more pressure on Pakistan? It should be used. It should be used by us during our discussions with the United States to point out that weaponry which they have given to Pakistan was meant to be used for fighting in Afghanistan against the forces who are uh, antithetical to the United States. But it is all being used against us. But this is an old story which has been going on for a long time. Right from the time of President Reagan, who gave that famous $3.2 billion aid package to Pakistan, the weaponry which was part of that package was meant to be used in Afghanistan. But we all know that such weaponry was used against India. I think it was V.K. Krishnamenon who famously said that the gun which can be used to fire in only one direction is yet to be made. This weaponry was meant to be used against Afghanistan, and uh, like the F-16s, and um, it's been used against us. But I think in the press conference, uh, we were little um, too matter-of-fact that uh, the wing commander is coming back, uh, we are relieved he's coming back. I think a word of gratitude, or, or well, at least uh, uh, performer thanks uh, were in order. And uh, I think we should have just kept the press conference to this matter relating to his return. And as regards the issue of uh, combating terrorism and that we are not letting down our guard, of course, it's, it's evident that we are not going to let down our guard. But perhaps that could have been left for another day. My own um, view is that... Uh, uh, there is a sense of relief in the country that the wing commander is coming back and the press conference should have been utilized to address that aspect. Of course, but, but, uh, I repeat, Mr. Dal, is it really the fight up to against terror will uh, go up to, on. We will mobilize the forces. all resources at our disposal. Yes. But, uh, is it really up to the forces to address the emotion in the country at this point? Well, I agree. I agree. It is, but as a private citizen, now I'm, I'm a private yeah. citizen, citizen and I can voice my feelings in this regard. All right. I see, uh, I, I see Colonel uh, Tapar has his hand up. Go ahead. Look, uh, this is a military briefing, debriefing. It's a military debriefing. It's not a diplomatic or a ministerial debriefing. It's a purely military debriefing. The, the diplomats were mm -hmm. not even present. None of the people from the diplomatic corps were present. They are all service chiefs. So let us say, let us not uh, kind of uh, diffuse the, the argument. 
it was meant for conveying the forces point of view and i think that's very well conveyed i personally believe that the pressure if it is de escalated now we would have lost the little advantage that we have gained and ram mr ram go ahead i like the private citizens uh, intervention last about you know be positive the central thing and secondly the united states supposed to be a strategic partner i think it's quite unreliable i'd like to see the fine print on the sale of f16s mm. along with air marshal he made a very good point if you have the weapon uh, why are you not going to use it if uh, if need be so yes. i'd like to see the fine print but the us has historically been an unreliable partner it calls itself a strategic partner but to the extent the good news came perhaps first from uh, indirectly from uh, president trump we welcome that that diplomatic initiative if it's true because we have to be objective to the extent they helped uh, bring this about to the, we don't know how much i think we appreciate it but let's not forget that the us uh, has proved very unreliable in the past historically as a uh, visa vis india and pakistan absolutely so so when i i mean th that point again and i want to bring back i want to come back to what prabhu dayal said he said you know a, a word of gratitude or a word of appreciation for the gesture on pakistan side but it did seem of course fairly deliberate that india didn't want to do that well look i think we need to just keep one caveat in mind remember uh, the political leadership hasn't spoken on his return yet yes uh, personally if you ask me i don't see the current political leadership actually expressing gratitude in as many words i, I have a feeling it will be more underhand we, uh, we are expecting a press briefing from mr arun jaitley and ravi shankar prasad but right so you, at nine, we don't expect gratitude in that press briefing. i don't expect it to be overt it may be a little underhand it may be similar in content and tone as the service chiefs mentioned it that it's uh, something that is to be done under the geneva convention that's procedural that's not say, going beyond the procedure pretty much so and i think this what the services said today and what the political leadership might say is part, is also part of the politics that you and you know you, they, there was an opportunity here where uh, one person one journalist actually actually asked this question and said you know you said you are happy but are we grateful that they've made this gesture of peace and the answer was it is a gesture in line with the geneva convention it is not a favor right but the reason the reason i mentioned this Correct. was it is it is it is unfair of even the journalist to ask serving uniformed officers a question like that you yes. armies are not expected to show gratitude publicly in a situation where there is already a serious element of hostility it usually doesn't happen it's from the political leadership that we will get a real sense of what the indian government's mind is if mm -hmm. they also don't show actually you know i, I found this uh, also interesting the fact that up until now every briefing that we have had we only had two others there were no questions taken i found it you know again a departure from protocol that the service chiefs were required to take questions when they were obviously not in a position really to deviate from the statement that they had uh, i think it, that it is puts them in a difficult position no because i'll tell you the difference one because the previous two briefings were done by the uh, the diplomatic community the ministry of yes. external affairs and at that point of time they obviously did not have answers to all the questions i think today tonight there were more answers to it especially the good answer of or the good news of our wing commander being announced uh, back uh, but my my point larger is this I don't think it's fair for us to expect the armed forces in uniform standing when both armies are able to able to start expressing gratitude. I don't yes. want this pressure to be in the armed forces at all. Yes. They are a professional body unit which works and the instructions and commands of the government in power. I am more interested and keen to see and hear whether the government does that or not because if they also don't do it you're then, then setting the line that listen our position as a government of India is that this is no favor you've done to us. You have to your duty bound to do it and that's what you've done. You've just done what is supposed to have been done. Uh The marshal wanted to say something. Air marshal, go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, two brief points. One is yes. about uh, the USA, the reliability issue that Mr. Ram raised. This issue was deliberated when uh, under President Bush, uh, our uh, terms started improving, and uh, later we became one of the major buyers of equipment from uh, United States. So this point was considered at length, and uh, Indian establishment was of the opinion uh, that is the previous establishment as well as the present establishment that uh, now those fears which were there earlier about their unreliability are not material. Now whether it is right or wrong, I cannot say at this stage, but uh, it was a decision over which uh, prolonged deliberations were done, uh, and this started when uh, MMRCA uh, uh, tender was being considered. in 2005 or 4 i don't remember exactly 
when the US wanted to participate, they expressed their will to participate and they sent uh, response. Ultimately, the tender was issued in 2007, but uh, uh, the, uh, you know, that was the period in which the relations were improving. So that is one point. And the second point is about uh, uh, the uh, you know, Wing Commander's release and its link with other events. You see, the, the strike went in with a purpose and uh, a strike was done with a purpose. And after that, uh, the call for or the offer for uh, sitting on the negotiating table was declined. And uh, when this unfortunate event of the pilot coming in their captivity happened, thereafter, India's stance wo stand was that uh, it will be unconditional release. So till the uh, release will not be subject to any negotiation. That cannot be changed midway. Hello? But after the, and, uh, but I agree with yeah. everyone that we are relieved. I am personally very yes. relieved. But once the pilot is back, it will be perhaps, uh, uh, you know, a, a graceful gesture to acknowledge what has happened. And you can still maintain that uh, till the uh, terror centers are uh, demolished or Pakistan does something, we'll not probably negotiate. Yes, uh, very well said. Unfortunately, I have completely run out of time on this conversation. Gentlemen, thank you so much for making time for us at Mirror Now and helping our viewers. Um, and I must acknowledge myself, understand the situation far better. Uh, when we come back after this quick break, we'll talk about what happens next. India, of course, has a larger, bigger battle, that with terrorism. There are terror kingpins in Pakistan. Our job of completely dismantling terror is not yet done. How do we use the position we have and we've gained today to make sure that that job is seen through to the end? That's on the other side. Don't go anywhere.